Hey, I'm really, really happy, excited, honored to be sitting down with Angelica today for today's session. Uh, we're in the month of focusing on human trafficking. And, you know, it's still shocking to me when we're talking to individuals in our community or in different communities around the nation and we're broaching the subject of trafficking. It's still very real that people just like look shocked, like there's no way did that really happen. And um, yes, it, it definitely is still happening. Uh, this is a this is a massive issue in our generation. It seems to be losing as much of the flash and the popularity. There are other big topics that come on people's radars, but uh, human trafficking is still very much a systemic issue of human suffering in our generation. And I, I feel like there's a lot to go into, but today I'm really excited to just sit down and actually not talk about this big global pandemic, but to talk to an actual survivor, somebody that's been through this, this problem, has herself experienced exploitation, was herself trafficked. Um, Angelica, thanks for joining us. It's good to see you. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. I'm excited. Yeah, thank you so much for being open and sharing your story. And again, I feel like there's there's a lot to talk about, but probably at the end of the day, this is the most important conversation. It's hearing from people that have actually suffered this trauma, that have been through these cycles. And, and so for you as a survivor, why don't, why don't we just start um, first, some of your context leading up to the, the moment of being exploited, being trafficked. Um, you were trafficked at what age? 14. 14. So you're still really young. Um, maybe talk about some of the things that were leading up to your exploitation and yeah, some of those like the backstory as it were. Okay. So I, when growing up, I always felt like, I don't know, like I didn't matter. Um, I grew up in a loving home. You know, my parents, you know, we grew up Christian. Um, I have a brother and two sisters. It was a good home, but there was something there for some reason, I, I didn't know why, um, that I always just felt like I didn't matter, that if I were to not be on this earth anymore, like nobody would miss me. And I didn't understand that feeling, but it was super strong. So and that's um, like a that's like a like a cloud. That's like your internal world you're talking about. Yeah. Not, nothing that you know of that was like reinforcing that, like no parent parental rejection that you knew no. of. It's like a deep subconscious reality. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, when I turned 14, that feeling inside me was just so strong that I just, I couldn't do it anymore. And so mm -hmm. I tried committing suicide. Um, okay. I, I slipped my wrist and I was put into a hospital for treatment. And in that hospital, um, it came out, they did some therapy treatment and in that treatment, it came out that a family member had sexually abused me when I was younger. Wow. And so like those feelings of wanting to die, you know, um, all made sense at that point. Yeah. And I, I remember this and it was very hard for me and I didn't know what to do with it. Um, and I was angry. And yeah. so I decided I was going to run away from that hospital. And, you know, of course I was found the next day <laughs> and brought back. Um, and then I got sent to a wilderness camp in Utah for about four and a half months. And I came home after four and a half months and I just was still really angry. Like it felt like what had happened to me when I was younger didn't matter. And I didn't uh -huh. see like that there was any consequence for that person. And so one night um, I decided that I wanted to run away. And yeah. I, I felt like that was my only option. I felt like it was a great option at 14, you know, cause I felt like I knew everything also. Sure. Um, and so there was a guy in that hospital that I had met and he just seemed really nice. I did not get to know him all at all. Um, but he seemed nice and he had said, if you ever need anything, give me a call. Okay. And so I was like, okay, his name was Kevin. And I was like, okay, I'm going to call Kevin. You know, he seemed really nice, like harmless. 
So I called him, he came and picked me up and he brought me to his apartment and I wasn't there for too long um, when he offered me a glass of water and I drank it and everything just started looking different. Like I started sure. seeing, like seeing people hanging from the window, like in my body, I couldn't move. Yeah. Um, so, so he, not, he drugged your drink. And yeah, how, yeah. how long were you with him? I mean, you're with him for a matter of minutes and you're being drugged or do you guys hang out most of the night or? No, I would say probably he picked me up. We drove to his place. I mean, within like 15 minutes, wow. um, he had given me a glass of water and it looked like water, you know? Sure. So he was, he was definitely on the take. Like he knew what he was after. Yeah. I want to, I want to back up a little bit when you had the revelation that you'd been sexually abused um like and you're in this hospital setting obviously that's like a care setting that's a setting for some level of healing right, right. Are, you, are you in that setting for months is this a few days a couple weeks like how long i was there? in there i was there for three weeks before i like you know took off um okay. i would say within the first two weeks is when i remember that and wow. then they called that person in, you know, with my parents sure. and that person, you know, admitted to it, apologized. Um, did, and then it come, with, did it come out how young you were when you were uh, abused, sexually abused? It was somewhere between like five and six. Okay. So you're very little. Yeah. Very, very little. And so obviously blocked i mean you just blocked all that you had to disassociate. I, I had no memory like yeah. i did not remember at all and when that I, I just want to know what that was like when that memory came up that must have been pretty like a lot of anger a lot of rage lot i was of... very angry because i in the session that i was in um the first one like i i watched it like i could see it all happening and oh, wow. And then like I, I remember, yeah, and I remember, like, I, I remembered, I remember those clothes, I remembered, you know, all wow. that stuff, and okay. yeah. So really painful, and so there's a moment to try to reconcile or bring healing with your family, and that specific family member, but, but you felt like there wasn't real, like it, like it wasn't, like it didn't matter, like, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. and let's just move on, or? Yeah, I felt like like that that family member, you know, I feel like did, you know, feel bad and the sure. apology was sincere. Um, but I felt like that that's where it ended, like with my parents. And, you know, I love my parents. We have a great yeah. relationship now, but this is yeah. these are my feelings then, you know, as a 14 year old and how I saw life as a 14 year old. And yeah. so it it didn't seem like there was any anything that happened to that person. And so that played even more so in like my self-worth, like, am I not worth it? You know? Wow. So what after, you, what do you think, like now that you're, you know, hindsight's 2020, you're older, you're more mature, you're an adult, like, what do you think you could have, would have needed from your parents in that situation? And again, it's not, we're not trying to throw your parents under the bus right now. Yeah. Again, you, you even said, it's like, Hey, I was 14. So like we, our ability to process and that's a very real trauma that you're trying to process anything that you think would have worked or been more helpful in the way that kind of reconciliation moment was handled um i feel like i don't know about in the moment like in the session sure but i feel like you know i was in there for three weeks and then i just couldn't do it and that's when i what they call a walled yeah. and then I was found and brought back for another week and put in on, on the 51, not 51, 50, 24 hour watch, you know, because I was back on suicide watch. Okay. I, and then that's when I was sent away to that wilderness camp. So I feel like if they had tried harder, you know, like we're not going to just send you away um, for someone else to try uh, to fix you. Um, yeah. Let's work on this together somehow here as a family then yeah. I feel like that would have been really helpful. Totally. And so they obviously, they, they themselves are like trying to figure this out and probably didn't have tools and yeah. not 
And, and this is a little bit ago, and I think maybe this was a little bit more common practice back in the day, like, oh, my kid's struggling, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to send them away. Whereas maybe, maybe nowadays, parenting styles are like, no, like, we're going to figure this out. And anyways, anyway, so you're, you ran, you, you, you thought of somebody, this guy you met when you're in that hospital, and he seemed like a nice guy, like, well, I'm going to call him, maybe he can help. Yeah. And now you're with him. Are you at his place? Are you at a hotel room? Um, I'm at his place. He had an apartment. Um, yeah. and that's yeah, that's where he took me to. And yeah. so I just I remember being in that back room, um, in the bedroom and sitting on the bed. And that's when he gave me the glass of water. And you know, I'd never done drugs, I never smoked, like I was in the dare program, you know, I was a good kid. Um, and so everything, you know, after he gave me that glass of water, like I, I couldn't move. I had brought, you know, a bag of clothes. I brought my address book um, with our, our information, you know, our home address and all my friends and family in there. And so he took all that stuff. Um, not too long later, after I, everything just started looking weird, um, a group of guys came in and they carried me out in their van. And, um, the, I mean, there was approximately, it was between like six and eight, you know, people, um, like at all times was there. And so they took me to the head, the head guy, his name was Dave. They took me to his house. Um, and that's the first place that I was at. And so they, they threatened to hurt my family. I'll generalize like this is so this is not in Thailand or China. This is here. Actually, it's in Southern Orange California. County. Yeah. So it's down, down, in or- down in Orange County. OK. Yeah. And um, so they took me to the house and they threatened to hurt my family. And they they had my address book, you know, like I said, so they knew where my family lived. Um, yeah. They they drugged me and they drugged me a lot of the time. Um, and you know, they had guns and stuff around and there were a lot of them. And so we were at that house. I don't know for how long, but you know, then I became a missing person. Um, and my parents, you know, were looking and the police were looking for me. And because I had taken a bag and went out the garage door, you know, at first, you know, they considered me just a runaway. And, um, which I I initially I was, um, but that night when they dragged me, you know, and handed me off to the other people, you know, that's the night that I lost my, my voice, my, my option to say no. Um, that's the night I was taken and that's the night I desperately wish I could have gone back home. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And, And, and I mean, the way that night transpired, started pretty innocently you're you're in a pretty unstable place emotionally and you think you know i'm not being cared for the way i want to be cared for i'm gonna go find another place and you you reach out to somebody that you think maybe is safe and so here's a good moment i mean it's like how how well did you know the guy that you called i didn't yeah yeah and i, th- and I think for young people nowadays like with the advent of social media you know, we have access to so many friendships, but do we actually have the opportunity to vet the friendships? And, you know, somebody's reaching out on social media, and maybe we're having a hard time at home. Yeah, let's go get together. Let's go hang out. That that could potentially be a dangerous situation. And in your case, I mean, it it absolutely was. You, You reached out to somebody that you thought might be able to help you. And in fact, he's working for these guys. Yeah. That are, that are going to, I mean, they're on purpose trafficking people. So that's a crazy, that's a crazy moment. And, and I know you're a parent and you're raising kids. Anything that you want to say right there, that, at that kind of juncture of your story, what you would have done differently, what you could encourage young people nowadays to think about as they're, you know, navigating emotional distress, like what's, what's the process of vetting friendships? I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like, I know when we go talk at the schools and stuff, you know, and we try to like brainstorm with the kiddos, like a trustworthy person. And so, 
you know, one thing I try to instill in my son, you know, and when we talk at schools is like, find someone now that you can trust. So like, if the situation ever arises, whatever it may be, um, that you can call that person that you do know for sure that you can trust, you know, and run stuff by them and have that person be your sounding board instead of just flying by, you know, see your pants and like calling someone that you don't, you don't know, because I mean, this stuff is real. It does happen. And I, I never had heard of it back then. You know, I didn't know what it was. Um, it was just in the movies, but sure. you know, it is real. So absolutely finding someone that you can trust now, you know, prior to something ever happening. Yeah. And, and just recognizing that there actually is that beware, like, Hey, yeah. the, the bottom, the bottom can drop out. So figuring out how you can have boundaries and relationships and, you know, just inviting strangers in to a really intimate place with you. Well, we don't know where that's going to end. And again, it's not like everybody out there is a trafficker, but yeah, exercise wisdom, be smart. Mm -hmm. So, so in your case, you're, you're just looking for an out, like, man, I need a different a different reality. I'm running away from home. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm running away from home. And lo and behold, you end up getting drugged. And now you're, you're actually being controlled. So threats of violence, they're drugging you. And you're in a home where clearly crime is going down. There's guns. Uh, a lot of people, probably whatever, some level of like gang. It's like these guys are together. Yeah. And, and then what happens next? So my parents, um, so I have one thing I was going to show um, just because I always like to show it. And so this was me. Um, I, I became, you know, a missing person. I was on the news, the newspaper, um, many articles. And, you know, my parents went on TV, like, you know, in desperation, trying to look for me, my posters were in like three different states. Um, wow. There were people from church, you know, helping put them up everywhere. And the traffickers, like everywhere we went, they would pull my posters down. And then, you know, the next time we were at that location, like my posters were back up again. So they were really diligent in getting my posters um, up everywhere they possibly could. And wow. so my mom, um, she somehow, you know, found out where, where they were keeping me and she figured it out. You know, it was like, that, it was because, like before internet, you know, <laughs> but, you, but you're being held basically the same proximity of where you were abducted. Like you're in the same general area. Mm -hmm. I know I realize Orange County is a very big area, but it's not like you were taken to Texas. You're like you're still right. in Orange County yeah. and all yeah. these, all these posters are being put up basically in the area that you live that's that's crazy so somehow your mom figures out where you're at like she must have just been doing a lot of research and knocking on a lot of doors mm -hmm. yeah she she's the researcher she's amazing <laughs> and um so she called the police and she told them you know um i think my daughter you know is at this this house this location um oh, in hopes that they would go you know, try to get me, um, go there. Sure. Well, I, I remember this day very well because it was the day that they moved me, um, to a hotel. So I remember a phone call coming in and then they quickly, you know, put me in the van and took me down to beach Boulevard, um, into a hotel there. So the police did not come to the house to see if wait, I was there. Wait, 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 time out, time out. So the police just called the address that your mom they, suggested. Yeah, they called the phone number there and they asked if I was there. <laughs> oh my god! So, um, so I could have been, you know, I could have been found a lot sooner. Um, but oh they god. called. So how then, long into it was that? I mean, is that a couple weeks or? No, I think that was about a week into it. Oh my god, that's crazy. Yeah, they do it different now, you know, but that's how they did it then. <laughs> well, well, there's something to discuss there, because, again, this is this is quite a few years ago. And so mm -hmm. the awareness around what trafficking is, how it happens was much lower back then. But yet we still see that among certain communities, law enforcement officials, they're they're 
education and their awareness on what the issue is, like you could have easily been lumped into that kind of demographic. Well, she's just a runaway drug addict. Yeah. She's, she's not actually being, you know, whatever forced against her will to do things. She's just a runaway and she's a, she's a runner and she's into drugs. And, and yet the reality was like, you were actually being held against your will. So the, yeah. the dynamic of education, which is why we have these conversations, right? Like, no, it, it it's, it's different. It, it works like this. And that actually becomes empowering. So when people are in authority, they can make good decisions and, um, Okay, so they call your traffickers to move, move you to another location. And, and were they already forcing you into sex for sale situations or not yet? Yeah, they were. They, at that point, it was, they were dragging me a lot. Um, yeah. I, I would wake up in the midst of a situation. Um, okay. I would wake up the next morning, you know, realizing something had happened clearly the night before. Yeah. Um, I, I would pretend like I was out when I really wasn't um, yeah. because I was scared and, you know, I didn't want my family to get hurt. And I was 14 and I, I believed them, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, yeah, and I realized this is, this is sensitive, but, but obviously to me, that sounds like the men that were participating in these moments clearly like they would, they would understand, okay, I'm having sex with somebody against their will. Mm -hmm. there, there's no measure of like, this is a date and, you know, like, like you're clearly not even present. Coherent, you're, not, right. you're not coherent. So, cause that's one of my big questions is do sex buyers understand what they're participating in do they do they know they're feeding this cycle of of exploitation violence people being held against their will and it sounds like in your case it's clear these men would have like they would have seen well that this is a very young girl she's mm -hmm. not even coherent during the act so they they know they're crossing a very big line yeah yeah that's heavy yeah. to me it's so heavy to me so, so this is happening for you at whatever rate you, you're being trafficked, uh, you're being drugged, forced to have sex with, with sex buyers. Um, you're being moved to different locations. And this, you know, within a matter of a couple of weeks, it's already pretty, it's happening a lot, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah, it was happening a lot. And um, like they they would when people would come knocking at the door um and it would get hot you know um they'd either like put me up in one hotel had a murphy bed and so they you know put me up in the bed so when the door opened like nobody would see me um wow. they they would record everything all the time there was always a recorder going so if people did come in and i were to ask for help you know they would just play it back um okay. and laugh at me and so when things got hot, you know, they'd move me to another hotel. Um, so we were in numerous hotels. I, I remember um, the head trafficker, you know, one night he told me how much he loved me, um, mm -hmm. which I was 14, you know, and he was 35 at that time. Um, mm -hmm. It was just, it was just sick. And they also robbed homes. Um, so they would bring me with them when they were robbing homes and I mean, going in and stealing stuff and I would never take anything, but that right there made me feel like that I was doing something against the law. And so even though I was, was not taking anything, I was still present and I was forced to be there, but I thought, yeah. you know, if the police found me um, and rescued me, then I'd go to jail, you know, cause yeah. I'm 14. I don't understand you know, everything going on. So that was very scary for me too. Well, and there's dynamics. I, I want to get into this a little bit. Like there's dynamics where you're being controlled and forced into situations. You're very vulnerable. You're 14. Uh, you have the threat of violence right at your fingertips at any moment. Whoever's in charge of all this is, sounds like very coercive, you know, trying mm -hmm. to manipulate you. I love you. Um, like talk about some of those dynamics. Cause I think 
some some people don't understand trafficking. They think, well, why didn't you just run? Like, like what's going on when you're in that kind of a vulnerability? You're being controlled. Violence is right at your fingertips. Someone's coercive, like trying to manipulate you emotionally. Is it is it an easy thing to get out of? No. Like, what's going on in your mind and spirit throughout throughout whenever you're kind of coherent and conscious, you know? I mean, there was a lot going on. So I was never alone. I mean, there was always someone watching me. So I for one, I couldn't get away, you know, there was never a loan option time, like to get away. I was drugged a lot. I was given so many different things, you know, and, um, and I have no idea what they were. And so being drugged, having someone watch me all the time, having a group of guys around me, the majority of the time, knowing I'm outnumbered and the threat of my family being hurt, like that, that meant the most to me. And all that combined, like I, I had no way I had no option. Yeah. And then they're, they're, they're recording every conversation yes. playing back. They're playing back to you uh, audio that just confirms there's no way out. They're laughing at you. They're shaming yeah. you. I mean, you, you've got to feel so powerless in that situation. I'm imagining. It was very powerless. There was one night yeah. that a guy from that hospital came to the hotel room and I don't know if he was there to buy drugs or a stolen item. Um, but I had called him into the bathroom and was begging for him to please help me. And it was then that I realized what they were doing. So I was begging him. I was asking him, help me, please help me. And we ended up, um, you know, walking out of the bathroom and then he left the hotel room. And as soon as he left, you know, they pressed play on the recorder and that's, they were just laughing at me. And it was then that I realized what was really going on with the recording thing. And that yeah. I, that I couldn't ask for help, you know, so I was stuck. <laughs> so heavy. And then the dynamic that they're bringing you along like other criminal enterprise ventures. Mm -hmm. So you're an accomplice or you're, you're one of them. Right. Um, I think that's the other thing that I see so often with trafficking specifically sex trafficking people in here in the west where we're so inundated in a hyper sexualized culture we almost we almost feel like sex for sale is a rite of passage for young young males um, thankfully i think that's less true now than it was as i was coming of age 20 30 years ago but but to stop and recognize sex for sale is criminal enterprise mm -hmm. and it's surrounded by other criminal enterprise like there are multiple survivors i've talked to that were in the life or in the game that were in that space of sex for sale like there are other dynamics of criminal activity going on and i think for buyers especially to just wake up and like oh i am participating in criminal enterprise and the people that are at the top of this are they're criminals yeah <laughs> violent individuals that hold power over vulnerable individuals and that power is not a it's not a pretty dynamic it's it's violent it's manipulative it's coercive um so yeah i think again all reinforcing the dynamic for somebody that's there like yourself you're powerless and you're like yeah. what can i do so so this is happening. This is ongoing. It's unfolding. What happens next in the story? So like, there was how did how did transition start to happen for you? So there was one of the traffickers. He um, one day he came and told me. He said, "You know, they're planning on taking you to Arizona tomorrow, and they said they can make a lot more money off of you." and you'll never be found, and you really have to get away, and so I was like, what do I do, what do I do, and um, again, they recorded everything, so they played that back in the hotel room, they made him strip off all of his clothes naked, and he ran out of the hotel room while they shot at him, and after that happened, they all turned around in the hotel bed and they pointed the 22 sawed off shotgun at me and they said, I'm never getting out. And I just remember sitting in the corner of that hotel room 
crying. Yeah. You know, by that time I was like sucked up skinny. Um, mm. I had de- they had dyed my hair jet black and I had started smoking, you know, they had me smoke. And so I just remember sitting in the corner of the hotel room, just smoking and smoking and scared and having this gun pointed at me. And I knew I had to get away. Like this was my only mm. chance, but I didn't know what I was going to do. So I don't know. It seemed like hours later, um, this can, couple. Can I ask? Can I ask before you go there? Were Were there any kind of details that he shared with you about? Hey, they're taking you to Arizona. Like I don't know if he described what that meant and what happened in Arizona. Like, is there a different level of trafficking going on there than there was in Orange County? I, I don't know. All he said was that they were planning on taking me to Arizona the next day, and they'd make a lot more money off of me. So I don't know. Uh, He didn't go into more detail than that. It was like a quick conversation. Like you've got to get out. Um, And so so, keep keep going. Sorry, I interrupted you there. No, it's all good. So I'm, I'm sitting there, you know, scared. Um, Seemed like it went on for hours. They were just cracking jokes, pointing the gun at me. You know, they thought it was hilarious. And then Um, this couple came over that I had seen before that had purchased, um, stolen items before. And the, the boyfriend was looking at a TV while he was busy, um, with the people that were in the room, the traffickers that were in the room. So they were all looking at a TV and the girl was, you know, doing her thing. And so I whispered to her just really quick, please help me. And so she said they were going to come back later. And when I saw them to run and so it must have been that they were all busy talking to him about the TV because that was never recorded. Wow. Um, so How much older do you think this gal was than you? She, I believe she was about four years older than me. I believe she was around 18. So she's young too. And they're yeah. like, they're like buying stolen items. So somehow they're like connected to this criminal enterprise. Wow. But she's young. Okay. Yeah. So a couple hours go by and the hotel room that we were in was like on the second story. And um, the the window, the blinds was open. So I could see, you know, way down the sidewalk area and I see them walking up and I like, don't even blink. I don't look around. Like, I just remember bolting out that door as fast as I could, not looking back, just running like for all my life, you know, because I was. And, um, we all ran down the stairs, you know, jumped in the car and started driving and I turned around and, you know, I saw the traffickers in their car chasing us and I saw their guns in the car and, you know, we're driving, driving, and then we get to a grocery store parking lot and, um, the guy pulls over and he turns around and he says, you know, I really wanted that TV. I think I'm going to trade you back for it. Oh my and that I just remember my heart sinking and like getting super scared and then like everything blacked out. Um, I wow. don't remember after that other than waking it up in a hotel room um, with someone that I didn't know who he was. Um, I'd never seen him before, but I wasn't scared. And okay. uh, yeah, he, and he gave me something to eat. Um, I ate it. I remember going back to sleep and then I ended up at this gym. So one of the traffickers, his mom. Let's go back. Let's go back a step. So when you're in the car and you black out and then you wake up in in what felt like a safe place. I mean, that sounds to me like you're, you're disassociating. Like the trauma is so real again, that you like something else is taking over because you've been through enough. And your mm-hmm. body knows, like your body knows what may be coming next. And and it sounds like maybe God intervened there at, at a yes. certain level. Okay. That's the only thing that I can think of because I, I don't know yeah. how I got there. I don't know who this person was. Um, okay. maybe, so, maybe the woman, maybe the woman that you'd whispered help to stepped in and was like, no, we're not, we're not giving her back. And at any rate, yeah. you're in, you're in a safe place. You've got some food, you're getting some food in you. And then I hadn't eaten and I don't know how long. Um, I mean, I was, I was so, so thin, so dragged out. And um, 
So I, I went back to sleep. I remember falling, just eating this hamburger and falling back asleep. And then I woke up at this gym. So one of the traffickers, his mom owned a gym out there. And she had said that if I ever needed, you know, a place to stay or anything, you know, that I could go there. And so I ended up there and she showed me around the gym, showed me where I could sleep. She showed me a tanning bed that I could sleep in that wasn't plugged in. <laughs> and then um, I remember looking out the front door and I see all of the traffickers getting, you know, walking up to the door of the gym. And so I ran into the bathroom stall, into the very last stall in the girl's bathroom. And I just remember like squatting, like on the toilet um, and just frightened. And it was like, I always describe it. It's like a movie. Like they yeah. came in and they were like kicking in every door, you know, first door, second door, third door. And for whatever reason, they stopped right before they got to my door, they stopped and they turned oh. around and they walked out. And I just squatted there on the toilet, just scared out of my mind, you know, for the longest time. And um, then I, I finally, I got off, I went out, you know, I, was, I looked around, I got out, they weren't there anymore. And so I went outside, I walked on the railroad tracks that night, I wasn't going to come back till it was dark. Um, so I came back when it was dark. And then I saw a couple undercover police officers um, walking out of the gym with my stuff. And can we can we can we do something here? So you're out walking, you're leaving the place. So somebody had offered you safety there, but they were associated with your traffickers. Yeah. Now you're you're off on your own. And to me, this feels like an important thing to to open up a little bit. Like you're off on your own, but in your mind, you're like, I'm gonna go back to that person that offered me safety who's associated with my traffickers. Because to me, as somebody who hasn't been exploited, that wouldn't have been a, an option for me. Right. An option would have been like, I'm going, getting as far from those people. And may, I don't know, maybe pursuing the police, maybe pursuing my family. So t talk about why those weren't options for you. And again, you're young. So this isn't us trying to tell you what you did wrong. I, right. This is us right. like learning because other people that may be in certain circumstances, I don't know, maybe they can get some wisdom off of you. <laughs> like, yeah. Why was the option to go back to the mother of the trafficker? So I, I was scared for many yeah. reasons. I, I thought, you know, if I called the police that I was going to go to jail um, because of wow. being present when they robbed homes. I mean, wow. they, everything that I was wearing was all stolen. Um, yeah. Everything that they had taken, I mean, down to my clothes, you know, all kinds of diamond rings, like everything that I had on was all stolen merchandise, but that's all I had. Yeah. Um, I was drugged. I was coming off of drugs that had been mm -hmm. what, like a day or two. And I don't know what I was coming off of. Sure. I was scared that they were going to hurt my family um, if I was found because they had threatened that. And so uh -huh. I... I set, I guess, me aside um, because my yeah. family came first. And also, I was afraid of calling the police. I didn't know what was going to happen to me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that I mean, was not an option in my head. Totally. And this is the thing. It's like when you're, when you have been inserted into that world where trauma and violence and coercion is the norm, the, yeah, the powerlessness that you're suffering from and the inability to see a wide range of choices. And, and again, you're very young, mm -hmm. you're 14. Um, it, to me, it, it's just, a, it's something to really discuss and look at. And because so often people will say, well, why didn't you run? And it's like, even when you had an opportunity to run, you really, I mean, you did, you definitely made that choice to get off the hotel banister off the second floor mm -hmm. and get out. Um, that was a courageous decision. But now you're like almost so close to full freedom, yeah. but, but you're like, I don't really know how. It's like, that's what I hear you saying. It's like, I'm not really sure what my choices actually were. Yeah. Um, pretty, yeah, pretty important knowledge. 
one thing that I didn't talk about was in the midst of all that, when they had me, there was one night that they had me call my parents. And so oh, the head yeah. trafficker, he dialed my parents' number. And, and I remember it, we were, it was raining outside. We were at a pay phone and they called and said, you know, we have your daughter, but she's safe um, and put me on the phone. And they wanted me to tell them, you know, that I was fine. I was safe. I had not been taken. And so I, I guess I was just crying and crying. I've talked to my parents about it since, and there is an article on it um, that I was, I was crying. And I told my mom, I said, change the locks on your house. Um, and so in, in that moment, and then he took the phone and he hung it up. And then it was like a minute later, he called back again and had me go back on the phone and tell my parents I had not been kidnapped um, no. and then hung the phone up again. And so it was, I think in that moment, you know, it clicked for everybody. Um, she's not just a runaway, you know, like there's yeah. something way more to this. And, you know, in that same article, the it was the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children. Um, you know, they were discussing in that article that this wasn't just a runaway case. Like there's clearly more to it than that. And, and before we go deeper, I want to talk about the posters, because to me, that's a that's not as prevalent now, is it? Like we don't mm -hmm. we don't really we don't really see those missing children posters like we used to in the 90s or when was your story? 90s, 80s? Um, it was 28 years ago. So what, 1995? No, less than that. Yeah, Let me right. see if it says 1993. <laughs> yeah, 90s. yeah, my 90s. date missing is November 21st of 1993. Yeah, 90s. So, so kind of before trafficking has become such a popular topic, whatever, like in the media and in cultural awareness, like we're, it's pretty popular. Back then it was not very well known subject. Mm -hmm. People weren't weren't aware, and yet your story is still so relevant to today. So those posters, do you think those were helpful? It feels like they were to create some community awareness, especially if your traffickers are like pulling them off every time they see them. Yeah, or, I know but, they got a lot of leads because of my posters. Okay. Um, so my posters were helpful and also not helpful in the sense that, um, and I I didn't realize this um, until recently when my parents and I were talking that yeah. people that kidnap, um, they also do look at posters. And so there was a group from, oh, I don't remember, somewhere in another country, was it Afghanistan or something like that? There was a group that was actually also looking for me um, to take me because of my posters. So uh, um... they, were, they were helpful to try to find me. Um, and like put the heat on, you know, because everywhere sure. we went, there's me. Um, but yeah, people also use them for bad. Yeah, that's like marketing the exploited. Okay, we know these individuals are being exploited. So there's mm -hmm. a whole, whole higher level of vulnerability, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so back to your, you're on the train tracks, you turn, you're walking back to the, uh, gym or tanning salon or whatever it's called it was a gym yeah but they also yeah. had like tanning and stuff um so i you know i have a hat on it's like really low um i see a, a two undercover police officers walking out with it was like a big black trash bag with my stuff in it okay. and i saw them and i got scared and i turned around and started booking it i ran um, and they chased me and they, you know, handcuffed me and put me back in the police car and took me down to the station. And, um, they took all my stuff, you know, like all the jewelry. And this is just so interesting to me, which they would do it so different nowadays, you know, but they took all the jewelry off of me, which they were real diamonds and all the stolen jewelry. They bagged it and they gave it to my parents. <laughs> And, you know, what 14 year old has all that stuff? Um, yeah. So they called my parents, my parents came down and, you know, by this time I'm coming off of, I don't know what drugs, um, I'm angry, I'm scared. And my parents took me home and I told them, you know, I'm just going to run away again. Um, yeah. 
Are you and are you sharing the story with law enforcement about what's been taking no, place? No. You're you're just pissed and like they're the enemy. They're they're I was scared what they would do to me, but I wasn't gonna say anything because I didn't want it to come out because I didn't want my family to get hurt. So okay. what would I didn't you, tell them what had happened. Totally. I wanna I wanna land here for a few minutes. Because I know law enforcement officers that we work with, and this is the, the common thread. It's like victims won't work with us. They won't talk to us because we're the bad guys, even though we want to help. Is, is there any insight there in that moment? Uh, again, hindsight, it's 2020. What, what would you tell somebody, especially I think it's more often the case with young people that are being exploited. Um, they're young enough and maybe unaware enough to get the fact that like, okay, wait, these people in authority actually can help me. Mm -hmm. um, what would you tell them if they were, if you were in that situation again, that, you I know, mean, they've, they've handcuffed you, they've, they've theoretically arrested you, but they're connecting you to your parents. So it's obvious they're trying to like help at some level. Right. Is there anything that can happen between a victim and a law enforcement when that victim is in a similar state as you that could be more of like an exchange. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I know. I... Yeah, I, I know they're doing it here in Shasta County already. I think it's called the Legacy Center, um, where you know whether whether whatever kind of issue it is, whether it's you know domestic violence or kids being abused or trafficking. You know, when someone's brought in, they have like an advocate in there um, that sits mm -hmm. with them and talks with them. And so I feel like. For me, if there was that kind of person and a female um, that was there telling me, you're not going to get in trouble, you know, mm -hmm. um, tell us what happened. We want to know we care um, and just being compassionate, you know, like I feel like that would have been so helpful for me, but that's not what happened. And yeah. it was, you know, I was, I was bad. I'm just a runaway. I'm just this, I'm just that, you know? And even okay. though there was all this evidence that showed I was not just a runaway, that's how they treated me. So um, you were hearing that. I mean, you were hearing like, you're a bad girl, you're a runaway, yeah. you're, you're using drugs, you're, you have stolen. Okay. So there we go. That big insight. If there was a female advocate mm -hmm. that could be a go between, between you and law enforcement, things could have, could have felt a lot different. So yeah, and you're right, that is an upgrade in terms of how law enforcement is handling situations like this nowadays. I think they're very aware of that dynamic. But still, I think that that's a good little moment, just a little sidebar. Okay, so you're back with your parents now, but you're pissed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm pissed. I was taken. All this had come out about my family member prior to that, which is why I ran away. And I was not found sooner. Um, and so, yeah, I'm mad and I'm coming off of drugs. And so they, they took my shoes. Um, I remember just being angry, punching the walls. And I said, I'm going to run away again. And, um, like I just, it was so much build up in me. It was just insane. And so any, the next, any kind of disclosure with your parents on what was happening, even though there's all that anger in any moment of like, yeah, this is actually what was happening, mom, dad. No. No. So you had, you had been so traumatized. And, yeah. and again, from a little girl, like so much had been happening to you that it was still not the time to ask for help. And I think this is a big, a big revelation when somebody is in a situation like yours, being trafficked, being exploited, it, it may not be common to say help. Yeah. I mean, you did, you did to that couple in the hotel, which is beautiful and brilliant. You stopped and said, Hey, I need help. Um, but, but I think that process of asking for help, receiving help, there's a lot there. It's not so black and white, <laughs> right? No. Like there's it was a lot fear. of fear. I mean, okay. for, for that, it was, it was all fear. Okay. Like afraid that your traffickers were going to do something to your parents. Yeah. Yeah, and okay. I had a little sister at home, and I had an older sister at home, and yeah. um, it I, I was very afraid. Okay. And what would you what would you tell somebody in a situation like that right now? Something they could do. 
young, afraid. Traffickers are still very much in their network, so to speak. Yeah. Like could could, could reach their family in a heartbeat. What what would you tell a young again? Maybe she's fourteen. Maybe she's sixteen. Now, with hindsight, anything you would say to her? And she's in the same boat you are emotionally. I don't yeah. want to ask for help. I'm afraid. To tell. Okay. Yeah. And it's kind of like risking the consequences. So I'm like, okay, I'm just going to tell and we'll see. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, I mean, we'll, we'll, as a family unit, you know, work it out together. Nice. But that's not a decision you made back to your story and you, what, what'd you do next? So the next morning I woke up and, um, there was a van <laughs> waiting, um, my youth pastor and a couple other people from church were there to pick me up and drive me back to that wilderness camp. Um, okay. cause my, my parents didn't know what to do. Um, I was on drugs. Those people were looking for me. And, um, so they drove me back there. So within, I don't know, the first couple of weeks that I was gone, um, there were people calling, looking for me. There were people, weird people coming by the house. My parents had to change their number. So they were looking for me, um, but I was not there to be found. And, and then it came out about that group, you know, from the other country that was also looking for me. And then my wow. parents, um, my parents got a call. So the trafficker that had told me that they were going to be taking me to Arizona, he called my parents and he told my parents what had really happened. And he told my parents, you know, everything. And he also told them that he's the one that called the police and told them where to find me at that gym because he knew that they were coming back for me. Um, the traffickers were coming back for me there. So he, Whoa, so this guy, this guy had like a, whatever, a revelation, he, like there was some compassion flowing through him or something. Is, is yeah. that what you're saying? Something. I mean, he's the one that told me they were going to take me to Arizona. He called the police and told them where I was at. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. I thought you were talking about the head trafficker. No, you're talking no, about the guy. No, no, no. Not oh, him. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sweet. Yeah, it's the same one. And then he called my parents and told them everything that had happened. And so I was at that wilderness camp and I was just not doing well. Um, I was there for another, I think three months. And I just, I was, I was not healthy mentally. I was not doing well at all. And so, you know, my parents had to make the choice, you know, do we prosecute? Um, if we do that, then we have to bring her back. And by that time, I guess I had semi just started doing a little bit better. Um, mm. And then they would risk my placement because they were putting me into a group home in Oklahoma. Um, so they had gotten a placement for me there and I was going to live there for the next year and a half. And if they had brought me back to, and I would have to testify, um, then I would lose my placement and they were afraid that I was going to start doing, you know, horrendous again, like I was prior so sure. yeah, they yeah. had enough experience. So like, I, I don't know how stable our daughter is and mm -hmm. that makes sense. Were they, were they at all? So the trafficker that, you know, disclosed all that info, was there also like, and these are the people involved so that the police could actually form a case or was that not the process that was unfolding? Um, all I know is because we we didn't talk about it for many years. Um, actually, just recently, I actually just talked to my parents about everything. Wow. And because I had many years of pain and self harm, um, and we weren't in the place to discuss anything. And um, they knew who they were, but um, you know, my mom knew the home that they were living in, so she knew who they were. They knew who they were, um, but they were not they didn't want to do that. So at that time, apparently, you know, like the police didn't take it on. I don't know if my parents actually told the police or did not tell them. I have never asked them that, um, but there was not a case. Yeah. Yeah. And I understand that, that dynamic of like, Hey, we've only spoken about it recent until recently, because again, so much trauma, uh, so much pain, Th these aren't easy things to approach. Right. Right. 
So you're you're finding some measure of, of um, stability out at this uh, wilderness camp farm, whatever you'd call it, and you're out there for how long? So the first place was the wilderness camp. I was there for about three and a half months, three three and a half months. And then I wasn't doing well at that place. So then they found me a placement at a group home um, in Oklahoma. And I was there for about a year and a half. And um, I was doing okay. And I I, I got in a lot of trouble, Um, but then I started doing okay. And I felt like I could come home. So even at that young of an age, because of everything that had happened, I'd already got the mindset that my value was not me. It was not my heart, my mind, my value was my body. And, um, and if I was with someone, if I slept with someone, you know, then I was worth something for at least that moment. And, and it was sad, you know, um, and that's a struggle. And so that's, that's what I did. Yeah, I mean, what you said, it was sad, but very understandable. I mean, what you've been through. And then even, even if even if you hadn't been through what you've been through, culture reinforces that to young women, even without being exploited or abused. It's like, you know, if you your, your sex, your sexuality, your beauty, your body, like that's what makes you valuable. Are you attractive or not? So I get it. And then, you know, throw on top of that the exploitation that you'd suffered um crazy so so i'm 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 wondering when you're in that sounds like about a year and a half to two years of placements Mm -hmm. were you were you openly talking about what had happened to you or was that completely no no nobody really knows You, you just keep that to yourself in terms of being trafficked and exploited I briefly, I extremely briefly <laughs> talked about it, um, but I, I had acquired an eating disorder. Um, and so I, that's how I talked about it in a sense was I, I did it through my disorder. You know, I didn't talk to people much. Um, I, that's how I got my pain out because yeah. there were no drugs there. You know, um, you have to eat. And I, I got a really bad, bad eating disorder. Yeah. And again, it's back to that, the sense of self and you know, what, what your value, where your value lies, a lot of stuff going on inside of you with that trauma. Yeah. Um, So yeah, we're, we're getting into the, the next phase of the story, which is your, your restoration journey. And Mm -hmm. So you're free from your traffickers, but are you necessarily free from being trafficked? And it's, I think oftentimes people think, well, you're free from your traffickers, so you're free. And it doesn't always work like that. It, no, no. Getting free, getting free, whole, like holistically in your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions. Sounds like there was a journey ahead for you, huh? It's been a lifelong journey. <laughs> Yeah, I think we're all we're all there in some respects, but but having suffered what you've suffered, like I I can't imagine I can't imagine the dynamics. It's got to be intense, intense to say the least. What what do you want to share about that? Um, so you're still a teenager. What did starting to get more stabilized look like for you? Was was there like do you feel like you turned some corners? At what point do you feel like you started turning corners? Maybe is a better question. Um, it wasn't for quite a while. So I came home when I was 16 and a half. Um, yeah. I started dating a guy that sold meth um, because I knew, you know, I, I had found out, you know, when I was taken that methamphetamine keeps you awake. And I was having a lot of nightmares about what had happened to me. And I didn't want to sleep. Um, so yeah. I started dating someone that sold meth so I could use it and stay awake and not have to have the nightmares of what happened. Mm-hmm. Um, I, my eating disorder was really bad and I ended up being pregnant. Um, and then I had an ep- 
ectopic pregnancy and I was taken into surgery. And, um, if I hadn't had surgery that night, I would have died that night. And so Mm -hmm. God, you know, God totally, God's totally intervened so many different times in my life. Mm -hmm. And so after that, I ended up, um, getting in trouble at school, being under the influence in my senior year. And so I didn't end up graduating. I did later get my GED, but I didn't graduate. And I ended up living on the streets for a little bit. Um, cause I just couldn't stop using my parents had told me, you know, you can come home, um, after rehab. And if, if you follow our rules and one of the rules was to not use drugs. And I, I couldn't cause I, I, I would remember and I would have the nightmares of what had happened. And so I said, mm-hmm. I, I can't. Um, so I lived was, around for a while. Was there any kind of therapy coming your way? Any sort of like, whether group or individual counseling or yeah. anything, that felt, anything that felt helpful when I, when I say that? Um, it would have been helpful if I was ready. So I, I still had so much anger inside of me. Um, and I just, I wasn't ready. So my parents had a good counselor and I was seeing her, um, but it wasn't helping because I wasn't allowing it to, I was just mad. And, and I was scared. And I mean, I'd wake up screaming in the middle of the night, you know, from these nightmares and, and I didn't want to do that. Um, so I, you know, I lived in a shelter for a while and I got kicked out of there, um, for, for being under the influence. Um, I lived, you know, I lived around and then one night I was propositioned by this guy and he said, you know, you can have all the drugs you want if you do whatever I want. And I was like, why would I do that when I was forced to do that when I was younger? And Mm -hmm. for me in that moment is when my light bulb went off and I was like, I need help. I need to get clean and I want to get better. And so I called my parents, they came and picked me up and they got me into a a rehab that weekend. Um, Uh, How old were you there? I was almost 19. Okay. So, so a good, a good two and a half years or so after getting out of other, other programs. So that, yeah. that's a, that sounds like a, um, those two and a half years were probably pretty intense. They were very intense. Yeah. <laughs> very fast, very intense. I mean, yeah, I was, sounds- I was constantly high, you know, I, I didn't want to feel, I don't want to feel the pain. Yeah. Wow, but but your light bulb came on when someone propositioned you. That's, that's interesting. So so taking you back to that trauma, and you're like, that's like the end of your rope, right? Yeah, like no, I I can make a choice. I can make a choice today. I do have the choice to say no. Wow, that's awesome. I love that. I love that that happened in you. And so you're in a in a a rehab program now. Mm-hmm. So the, the drugs are starting to be addressed. The addiction. Yeah. Uh, but I'm also starting to feel and I'm starting to remember. And that's what I don't like. <laughs> and, um, so my eating disorder, you know, got, got even worse. Um, I started cutting and I never, you know, heard of that before, but I, and it sounds, you know, it's an, it's an interesting thing. Um, but it helps me with the pain and, it was like, it took it all away in that moment. Um, so I got another addiction in a sense. (laughs) Um, but so I, I, that was 20, 24 years ago now. So I've been clean for 24 years. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah, And I, I never, I've never used since. And like God totally took away that desire, um, to use. So That's amazing. But you're, but you're definitely at the time, you know, 24 years ago, you're still battling these other impulses Yeah. with an eating disorder, with cutting. So still a lot of self self worth and your sense of self is still very much whatever in, in it's shattered. Yeah. It's broken. yeah. You're, you're still very broken. Um, and I know there's so much more to the story. Talk a little bit about 
maybe if, if we can, I mean, I don't, I don't want to breeze over anything so we can talk for a long time. Is, is there any way of like, and in a nutshell, like this is how I've found a sense of self-worth or how I've overcome the trauma that was within me. Cause you're, again, you're 24 years clean, but you mentioned earlier, it's like, no, it's been a lifelong journey of healing. It um, has. Yeah. What? So learning to trust has been very hard. It's still something I'm still working on. Um, yeah. I learning to trust men, you know, is really hard for me. Um, was very hard. I've been working on that. So I did, you know, for about seven years of my life, decide that, you know, all men have hurt me. And so I'm going to try to date women. Um, that clearly was not God's path for me. Um, and not who I am. And, but I, I did that because I was scared and I realized, you know, that's another story in itself. Um, but I got out of that lifestyle and like, that's not who God made me to be. That's not who I am, but I know why I was doing it. And so that was, it was neat in the sense that it gave me more compassion because what I found in that lifestyle is that literally almost everyone I came in contact with had been sexually abused when they were younger. And so it was able to give me like more compassion and more understanding. And, um, and then I, you know, I, I came to the point where I realized like, that's not who I am. And I got out of that lifestyle and then it's taken I mean, me it years. So, sense. I mean, it makes so much sense of your experience of men was not safe and sexual abuse. It makes so much sense. Like, Hey, let's, let's see what happens if it's just another woman. Yeah. Right. I, yeah. I can understand that. But you made discoveries in that lifestyle that were like, okay, this isn't, this isn't working. It's not, it's not actually filling the hole in my soul, so to speak. Huh? Right. And it's not, I mean, that's not God's calling on my life, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So I, I got out of it and, um, you know, I got into a relationship with a man that that's a whole nother story as well. <laughs> but um, there was a lot of, you know, physical abuse and, um, you know, he's now incarcerated for that physical abuse, but it was 15 years of that. And, but that all talk played about, into like talk myself. About how, talk about how you, how you chose that relationship though. Cause I think that's an important piece of information. So, so you, yeah. Yeah, I chose that relationship because when I had met him, he was big, like strong, big. And, you know, he was in a gang too. And he would protect me. And I knew he would fight to the death if he had to. And so in my mind at that time, um, I felt safe. Like I felt like, okay, I can, I can trust the man. Um, he's going to protect me. He's not going to let anyone hurt me. Yeah. But I didn't realize in the beginning that that could turn around on me, um, yeah. which it did. Yeah, so there's something there I want to talk about because I think this is really common, especially among young young girls. Um, some professionals I've interacted with who tell me, Lance, like I, I don't know what to do because the young girls that I work with, they're in and out of foster care like they literally, they want to be with traffickers. And when you, when you unpack why they want to be with those traffickers, it's because those traffickers are the most powerful people in their kind of environment. So they see big, strong, mm -hmm. gun, gun wielding, associated with other big, strong guys, gangs, um, maybe in some respects, even more powerful than the police because their criminal enterprise is successful. So, so again, she's like, I don't know what to do like these. And I'm like, well, I get it. They want to be where the, where the greatest power is because they've experienced so much lack of power. Right. And so in your case, you're like, this guy is big and strong. He can protect me, but you're not able to look up the chain of like, what's actually resourcing his power is, is the power he's operating in like a healthy sort of power, right. a power you, you can trust. And you're like, well, 
he could protect me physically. So, so I'm good to go. And yet, man, he's like, he's also involved in criminal enterprise. It's like, whoa, time out. I, I don't know if that's really going to be safe for you. <laughs> yeah. He had a lot of anger, alcohol, drug addiction, mental health issues, violence. Um, it was, he was not a safe person. Um, but by the time I, which was not long into the relationship, by the time I started seeing signs, I was already, I guess, sucked in, in a sense. And I didn't see, I didn't think I was worth more than that. Um, so my self-worth, you know, has played so much in the choices I've made in my life. Um, and I feel it's because of, you know, what I went through when I was younger is that self-worth. Um, so, so I stayed and, and I, I had two step kids. I felt like I needed to protect them. And, um, you know, I was strangled. I was hit, you know, major road rage. I mean, there's, there's so much that went on. I watched my son being strangled in front of me turning purple. Um, it was, it was, it was really bad. So I feel like for me, my voice, I was able to start having a voice. Yeah. So, so I didn't have a voice with my traffickers, but now I was able to have a voice with him when I started doing my restraining orders, when I started standing up for myself and saying, no, I'm not going to allow this anymore. And, um, you know, and, and then I was able to read my victim impact statement in court, you know, in front of him, like I was heard, the judge heard me and that has helped me so much, you know, so much. Yeah. I, th I think that is a really big revelation. you you get your voice and you start making choices when your self-worth aligns with that. When, when there is a lack of self-worth, so we talk about that, like, well, just, just make powerful choices or just dream for yourself a better life. And, but people without a measure of self-worth, those choices are almost impossible to make yeah. the, the ability to, to speak up for yourself or to choose life, so to speak, it, there, there isn't that foundation. Right. And so somehow, some way, like you, you were in the relationship, you, you just said, it, you're like, well, I felt like that's what I was worth. But eventually you start getting enough sense of yourself to like, no, I'm worth more than this. And, you know, you're reaching out to law enforcement, restraining orders. Sounds like it took time. It and took a lot of time and God definitely put the right people in the right place at the right time. You know, okay. going from like the sheriff's to my attorney, to the DA's office, to the investigators like he just he lined everybody up so perfectly and it's just amazing beautiful so so you're starting to have a different experience of law enforcement like they're really actually there to help and they're, oh, part, absolutely. Of the, they're part of the solution not a part of the problem yeah exactly yeah and i like today you know i have 10 years from cutting 10 years from my eating disorder <laughs> um, and you know i I told my advocate at the DA's office, um, you know, because of her, but mostly because of her, everything I've been through, but because of her, how amazing that she is, mm -hmm. I have decided to go back to school. So I've completed a semester. Um, I'm on my next semester. I want to be a victim advocate. So I'm going for my social work degree, you know, and I remember calling and thanking her, you know, cause she's just an amazing advocate. And she helped me so much, you know, and I want to be able to do that for someone else. Wow. Good job. I love it. And again, the advocate comes into play. Like you're, you're recognizing it's like that, that other female is, is a really important piece of the puzzle for you. Somebody that's walking mm -hmm. with you, somebody you can sound off with, maybe be a, uh, like a sounding board to, do you want to describe some of that relationship a little bit? Um, about being an advocate, just what your advocate's been able to be in your life, like the way yeah. they've, the way they've been functioning in your life. Yeah. Yeah. So my advocate at the DA's office, like, I mean, she's totally on top of it. You know, she'll call me cause there's been many violations, many violations. <laughs> so she'll call me every time, you know, that they get a violation in. she walks me yeah. through the process. She tells me, you know, like what's available um, if I need, you know, counseling, if I need, you know, any kind of assistance that they offer. 
um, that I might need. She'll tell me. I mean, she listens. She handles my phone calls when I call her and I'm stressed out, you know, and um, she's just super patient and awesome. Beautiful. I love it. So you're, you're doing, I mean, it sounds like the, there's a lot of change going on in your life and you're in a much more stable place. Is there anything that you would want to share? As you said, you said earlier in the interview that you, you have talked to your parents about some things that you didn't talk to them about for years, Mm -hmm. any sort of revelation there as you sat down with them, um, any insights on your own journey that might yeah. be helpful for people? Yeah, absolutely. So I, you know, after sitting down and talking to my parents, um, I've been able to put myself in their shoes, you know, what they were going through at that time and not, not judging, but learning to accept, you know, I may not agree um, with some choices, but I accept it. And I understand because I was not them, you know, I'm, I wasn't the parents at home that had a little child at home, like my sister that they also needed to protect, you know, and of course they've never experienced anything like this before. They didn't know how to handle it. Um, and they did the best they could. And, and also looking back, you know, like if they hadn't sent me to the wilderness camp after I was found, there were people coming around looking for me, So I could have been taken again, you know? Um, So, you know, I look at the whole picture and I feel like God worked it out how it needed to be. And I'm alive, I'm good. And I'm able to, you know, go go talk at schools. And I share my story at Simpson in a social work class. And, you know, I talk at churches and I'm able to share my story and hopefully help someone else and give hope you know, and bring more awareness. So it's all worked out like, like beautifully. Yeah. Well, well, you're an overcomer to say the least. I mean, you're, you're absolutely a champion and having gone through what you've gone through, it's like, I wish that on no one. I, I hate that it happened to you, but I love to see how you're using your story to empower others. And I, I do think there's so much education that's needed in our in our culture right now in our communities so that people's eyes are open to how these things go down and and I think mostly I think about uh, vulnerable teenager well it doesn't matter their age just vulnerable individuals that have suffered abuse exploitation on any, any level the the ability or the process of healing and getting out and getting free and staying free it's just not so black and white. And so these conversations are really helpful for people like myself who have not been exploited to understand, oh, okay, like this may be where someone's coming from and what would, what would being uh, valuable to them look like? And what would, what would not helping them look like? Cause I don't want to do things that don't help someone that's in a situation like yours. Right. So yeah, I just, I don't know. So, so thankful for you so much respect for you, Angelica. I really appreciate you sharing time with us here. And yeah, my hope is that these conversations um, empower other people. And hopefully even young people are listening to this can see some things to be mindful of, you know, like having good boundaries and not not inviting people in that you don't know who they are until you know who they are. And I think again, with the advent of social media, the kind of invitations people get to you know, into really sacred spaces like share nudes or come over to my house or let's meet at this party. All that stuff is like, wait, do you, e- do you even know who's on the other end of that social media profile? Right. Um, we, just, we just want people to be safe. And yeah, that's one thing we've had the p- pleasure of doing together. Uh, Angelica joins us as we go on to public school campuses and talk about what trafficking is, trying to educate children, youth, help them be yeah, ready and make good choices in that space. That's been really powerful. Your voice there and to see the girls come talk to you afterwards and they have their own stories to share with you. Mm-hmm. That's, that's been so valuable. Thankful that we get to do that together. Um, yeah, me too. Well, I, th- I think we're going to land this. And, and again, I, I've said my thank yous. You're, 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 I have many heroes. You're, you're another one of my heroes, Angelica. Thank you. 
for doing what you're doing, being who you are. Um, just continue to pray blessing over you, just that abundant life, favor, joy, you know, just stepping into your dreams. I love to hear that you're going back to school and starting to chase things that are important to you. I love it. I, I can't wait to see what, what comes of it. And, um, well, and so that's thanks. one thing like, like right there that I want to share really quick, you know, when I went off to treatment in eighth grade, like I didn't finish eighth grade. Then when I went to high school, you know, because I was taken and kidnapped, there were a couple of years that I didn't, I didn't go to school. Um, uh -huh. And so I always felt like, like stupid in a sense, you know, like I wasn't smart. And so going back to college, you know, was kind of scary for me. And I've gotten almost like all A's and one B and I've been asked to speak, you know, out of hundreds of people in one of my classes and now be a, a speech coach. Um, and so I can do it, you know, like you can do it. Like it's, it's, it's amazing. And I'm, I'm glad I went back because God, God's been really good in my life. That's so cool to hear. I love it. I love it. If, if, if you can do it, anyone can do it, right? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for, thanks for being with us today, Angelica. And for those of you guys that are um, joining this moment, thank you again. If anything in, in these conversations is moving you, inspiring you, encouraging you, please help us by uh, just hitting that subscribe button, hitting that like button, or sharing these. If you're on Instagram, just sharing these post with your friends or on your stories so other people can see what we're sharing and again we're we're just talking about trafficking january is national human trafficking awareness month and so we're going to be having a lot of conversations around the whole big issue of human trafficking angelica thank you peace god bless you i'm going to say goodbye thank you <laughs> right.